so we it should be live now i guess I think. are we though yeah. <laughs> hey live. everyone oh i'll just keep talking then and if we're not live then we're live we're live <laughs> we are perfect uh it's uh, episode 19 i guess it's time is flying by real quick so uh in this episode we have Ni Nadia Mogilev and hey, Jama, Jama Jurbaev. Hey guys. So what I'll do, what I do always, I will just say I'm stupid and then you guys can, you know, kind of talk about yourselves a bit. So maybe let's start with that. Let's start with me being stupid. That, that's a good start. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're stupid. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> yeah, <fuck me. laughs> I'm stupid. Uh, yeah, so I just, you know, uh, if you guys could talk about like a little bit about your background and, you know, where you're from, what you do, and so that we have like a good, uh, you know, playground to, to, to go from, you know. John, do you want to start? Uh, no, ladies first. All right. Well, gentlemen here. Go for it. Um, okay. Um, uh, I'm a, hey, everyone, once again, my name is Nadia Mogliv and I'm a concept artist at MPC Film Art Department based in London. Um, originally, I'm Russian, but I have been a citizen of the world for a while. I lived in the States before, now I live in London, and I work in the film industry now. And here is my friend Jama. Jama. Uh Hey guys, oh my god, after this, such a serious introduction from Nadia, I feel miserable. <laughs> uh, my name is Jama, I am from Tajikistan, uh, and you can spell it however you want, like Tajikistan, Tajikistan, all fine, I'm used to that stuff. And uh, I also work in London, and we're just next street to Nadia's office, and I work at Framestore as a senior concept artist. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think well, all about me. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I think for, uh, I, I can talk about a little bit what I will, I will be doing, and then you will just guys carry on and get talking. Yeah, I'm doing some pretty good stuff. Like recently, uh, I'm teaching this course at Learn Square, as some of you guys might know. And basically, I'm showing how to use 3D in an efficient way and how to make it more creative rather than. Uh, going to, to be very technical, so basically, three D code is my main tool because I feel I feel like this this is one of the programs that really reflects this idea of being more create on the creative side than rather than being on technical side. So as Nadia will be speaking, she is a really great speaker, by the way. Trust me, <laughs> I will be just drawing some stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> just washing hands and fuck off. Now I can I can just do stuff. Now it's your turn. <laughs> um, no. no. <laughs> so I guess I guess what I what I think uh, we've been discussing here and uh, what would be an interesting topic to talk about. And we kind of touched on this when we were we were having uh, Alex and and Levy uh, on uh, on one of the previous art cafes. Is uh, you know London art department because it's uh it's it's sort of a uh, different kind of beast compared to uh, how uh, film works in uh, LA and you know around the world. So I had an opportunity to work with MPC uh, back in 2012 for a brief amount of time. I was a couple of months, and I actually worked with Jama, and that's where I actually met met Jama first time, or you know, see, seeing you on Skype. Uh, behind uh, Virginie's uh, shoulders, <laughs> and um, and yeah, I had I had opportunity to see some of your files, and you know, I was like, "Fuck my life," and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, it it was totally different experience for me than working uh, in film here in Los Angeles. And you know, I, I, I guess a lot of a lot of people would be curious. I'm, I'm hoping. You know how this uh, experience looks like when you're in in our department in uh, London. What's the structure of work? You know, and I guess most importantly, like how how to get in because uh, you know there's a lot of artists uh, that think about getting into into this scene, and you know they are maybe trying to figure out like what what has to be done 
in order to you know get a job at MPC or Framestore and how this how this job would look like, you know? Well, the technical ability is definitely very important, but the most important thing is still the ability to come up with the original ideas, I think. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing that the person has to show. And uh, yeah, you, it's very surprising. Sometimes you see the portfolio and the technical ability is great and uh, the variety of tools that person can ha uh, can use, but the ability to come up with ideas, um, something that has never been seen before, I still think prevails. I think it's still the most important thing to show in your portfolio. Right on. So, because um, like, for instance, I actually can, can kind of buck it up. Uh, I haven't come up with anything too original. I was doing replicators. I kind of learned the technique from uh, Scott Robertson. He was using it on his uh, designs. And, you know, I kind of decided because he was do doing very high level uh, concepts or, you know, uh, experiments with this. Mm -hmm. And I just decided to take it to the next level and, and try to try to build something very specific and sophisticated, you know, instead of mm -hmm. just going high level, going really deep into it. And that was one of the reasons why I got into MPC uh, oh. for, you know, uh, X-Men. Uh, we were designing the the Sentinels, the future Sentinels. That was pretty much the reason because pretty much two days or three days after I posted those images, I was having a phone call with MPC. So that was like really quick. <laughs> um, I, I can, sorry for interrupting you, just as in, like it's because it's such an interesting thing. Like I was there when we started working in X Men, and we kind of like, like after like a small briefing and gathering all the references together, we kind of understood this this job will need some guy who knows replicator. And yeah. literally the same day, posted that stuff, and we were like, okay, we're gonna. Have this guy. <laughs> right, so, but that was you funny. Know, like, what's good about it? I like this example because b before you get got hired, you spent a lot of time learning the tool and trying to make something for yourself, and th that hard work paid off basically. So you got hired. And yeah, it was pretty, it was really cool. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I on, agree. Man. I agree. It's uh, a lot about uh, technical abilities and and you know creative ideas. Um, you know, I wasn't hired for anything else, just replicators, you know, and then everything everything yeah. else that I knew was kind of very useful to get things done, you know, but the reason for hire was was purely on, you know, on what you what you, what you just said, Nadia, you know, mm -hmm. the technical but, abilities and creative sort of approach. Yeah, and I guess you also need to decide need to decide for yourself. You could be a person very good at creature design, but never do, let's say, environments. And you would be probably hired as a freelancer more often rather than a part of the art department because in art department you have to wear a lot of hats because you don't know what kind of assignment is gonna. You come to work after a week and you you come in on Monday and you have no idea what's gonna what's gonna come. What are you gonna be working on? So the flexibility. Um, across the skills using different software and also being able to come up with ideas for all sorts of assets, environments, uh, hard surface, organic, everything. Yeah. So it's very important to be flexible if you want to work um, on a regular basis. Um, yeah, that's true. You can be for a certain ability you can be hired for a certain ability but you are most likely will be hired as a freelancer if you cannot uh, meet the expectations in other aspects in other assignments gotcha so you guys are um, on staff right now or how does it work uh, yes <clears throat> well I, I'm like a, I'm, an, I'm on the, on the contract so I'm full I'm a full timer but I'm not a staff member right yeah same. It's pretty much. Sorry. I guess it's a standard for you know VFX yeah. studios. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is standard. Um, yeah, I remember a, a couple of years before. Um, it's it's funny because like MP, studios like MPC, uh, Framestore, you know, uh, Double Negative, and all, and all of those studios, they kind of went into art departments very recently. Like I I remember even even just a couple of years ago. There was there was nothing like art department in London. Like there was there was a uh, you know uh, matte painting department and, and VFX related, but yeah. not really not really departments that were 
connected to uh, you know prep the film prep or or even like very early stages of, of um, you know pre-production um, right now is just changing um, yeah, things are changing very fast uh, you, you can see changing with every year yeah absolutely uh, it's, it's very interesting to see what's gonna happen how things are gonna look like in a few years because um, like for instance uh, on X-Men the majority of work we were doing we were kind of uh, we were coming up with ideas and sort of brainstorming ideas but that was very close to um, to VFX almost you know it was I think it was during the filming or right after the filming was done so mm -hmm. it, it wasn't even a prep whereas you know some of the work I'm, I'm there are some films that I'm working on right now and I can see like if the fi the filming is not even started it's scheduled for like you know a couple of months from now and I can see work works coming from MPC you know uh, yeah. or or frame store or mm -hmm. or stuff like that so uh that's kind of interesting shift because that wasn't there a couple of years ago um yeah. i wonder what's your turnaround like these days like when you get on the project uh how long it usually takes uh how long you usually stay with that project because i know uh you know mpc or frame store it's it's never just one film at a time you know it's not like a studio where it's usually, you know, if you, if the art department is created, it's it's only for a specific film, whereas you know you guys work on a couple of films at once, right? Yeah, well, that's why the deadlines are very quick, and it's important that again you have to be flexible because projects are in different stages. Some are pre-production, some are post-production, so you've got to be ready for anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is kind of, it is slightly different, you know, so you guys do, uh, I guess the turnaround is, uh, faster, um, because, because of that fact, you know, like the budgeting of, of, you know, and different stages of film and, and all those things that have to be done at the same time, you know, that was kind of like a different experience for me when I joined, uh, uh, film union here in Los Angeles, um, mm -hmm. usually projects are, like once you join the film, um, usually you are you are on pre-production for let's say three four months. Then you get on prep another three months, and then filming starts and and you're done. Uh, sometimes you you work through the filming, especially if you know director or production designer really like your work. They will keep you. And there are instances where, where people stay even throughout the whole film and throughout the VFX. Uh, I think I remember David Levy, uh, when he was working on Tron, he pretty much worked from very beginning to till the very end, you know, mm -hmm. till the very last uh, VFX shot. So, you know, that can happen too. Uh, that, that's when you spend like, you know, over a year on the film or something like that. But usually it's just like you join a film, it's a couple of months, unless they just fold it, you know, which happens a lot, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't know if people realize, but 80, 90, almost 80, 80% 80 of films that are being started never get finished. You know, it's only like 15, 20% of films that you work on actually get, get released. I had, I had quite a few films that I worked on so far. And one of the biggest one was the, you know, Tron sequel that pretty much we worked for like a couple of months and then. You know, Disney decided, OK, let's shut it down, <laughs> um, which was a bummer. But, yeah, that's that's something to be expected. So, you, like when you work in film um, compared to working, for instance, in video games. And I actually going to ask you a question right after this uh, in regards to, you know, MPC and Framestore and, and London in general. So when you when you're in uh, film in Los Angeles, uh, let's say you start on a project and it folds you usually rely on getting phone calls from you know from other production designers or directors that you already know if you don't if you're not getting calls you're not working it's not that, it's not that you know once you join a union and you work say for Warner Brothers that means you your staff and uh, everything is wonderful now it's usually you're always hired for a specific film um, and and that can stop any day and then you have about to you have I think they pay you three days and then you have to find another job you're not getting paid anymore so it, it becomes like a really stressful situation because every meeting every larger meeting can be a good or bad thing <laughs> uh, right. where 
where you know when you when you see producers coming in and having like a larger meeting with a director and production designer it it can have two outcomes you know one is just because of their the alignment and trying to figure out like what's uh, you know what's going to be next step or maybe budgeting or and whatnot um or it can just mean that ah oh, yeah we're folding you know uh so i i've seen this happen quite a lot so I wonder how it is when you when you work, uh, you know, with with studios like MPC and and Framestore. If you could kind of just talk about it a little bit, because I, I I I assume it's similar, but you know, I might be wrong. Jama. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, this trim is just making my computer run really slow because I have this 5K monitor. Anyway, maybe it's good that it doesn't. It's not responding, so I will just respond to your question. Uh, respond to your, to your question. Well, it, I think in the studio it's a little bit safer in, in terms of like uh, there's always work. Like in, in and because we are working on several projects at once, <clears throat> uh, you kind of like. Even some you you're right though like sometimes some projects they just drop because like they fail to get funding or for some other reasons. Yeah. But uh, there's always work like you know, there's always work to do and like I, I believe that this is kind of a golden age of what we are doing right now because like with VR coming to, to the market it's gonna be like a huge huge market for everybody from concept artists for pretty guys for everyone. It's uh, so work is always there, and working in studio you're a little bit safer in terms of like if you you're good enough, they won't fire you. Probably, let's hope. <laughs> so you just uh, stay around and do your own stuff. But uh, like you're saying, it's a it's it's a very um, uh, this industry. It just keeps growing with every day, and uh, we get a lot of like pitch works as well like for example doing not stuff for free but company agrees to get involved to probably do something new you know like vr kind of stuff and uh, all other new things that are coming together and uh, coming up and like it's occasionally we do work just for like if the project has a potential, you know, directors come comes in and it tells us like, look, let's do this pitch, and if we win, you know, like we you will get these jobs and stuff like that. Right. Uh, hey, Jama, um, your stream went down, by the way. Um, I don't know if you want to reopen, go to meeting. Oh really? Yeah. The computer exploded. Too much, too much three D coding. Man, my computer died. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I think I will need a restart. So sorry, guys. That's okay. But yeah, I mean, it it does feel like it's a safer option. I guess uh, Nadia, you can you could chip uh, in. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a safer option, but at the same time, uh, you you cannot relax. There there are other um, things that you have to be aware of. Uh, for example, you have to be very flexible with switching, as you, as you mentioned, that we work on a lot of projects at the same time. You have to be very flexible switching between different projects when if you are a freelancer and you work on a certain project, you kind of focus your creative energy and you immerse, right. I guess, in one thing. Uh, and there, working for a house like MPC, you have to be able to switch the gears really quickly. Yeah, I remember that when we had when we had because we were working on Guardians of the Galaxy and X Men at the same time, mm -hmm. and it was just like every day it was like even every hour it could be something different. Like oh, so like right now we were waiting for a feedback from VFX uh, supervisor. So in the meantime, jump on this and do real quick and let's catch up in two hours and see where you at. I was like ah, yeah, <laughs> I, I was planning lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, besides, you have to have certain sensibilities. You kind of have to know who, what kind of, who, who, who is the client, what kind of work, what kind of approach the client prefers. For example, if you yeah. work with uh, uh, VFX supervisors, some VFX supervisors prefer photoreal, super finished, high quality stuff, and some people respond to sketches, um, sketches more. Yeah. So you have to know not just what are you going to do, but also how you're going to approach it in order to sell your idea better. 
Yeah, it's very similar in film. Like, you know, there are there are directors that respond to realism really well. Yeah. There, are, there are like I, I've heard uh, from more than one person that you know James Cameron, for instance, loves uh, traditional sketches. You know, yeah, uh, he, he's responding for to them really well. Um, yeah, every director is different. Every production designer is different, and it's kind of like for me, like what I've what I've noticed when I'm working in film is just like it usually takes me, you know, two or three days to kind of get used to. What are the requirements, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then kind of going from there. But I also what I what I try to do often is just kind of let them know that there's also a very productive way that I I'm used to, and mm-hmm. if they conform around that, they will get better results, you know. If you if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not all. Like you have to be careful with this approach because uh, it, it's you have to. I guess like you. They have to really trust you uh, as an artist, and you know, and usually, it, usually they will if if you know you put it up front as they are hiring you. But you're also limiting yourself to, you know, um, to opportunities that way. Um, I for for now, I just uh, I've just been really lucky uh, with uh, with projects where you know I had opportunity to to kind of work the way I work. Um, but I also did, you know, conform to what project specifics were, and that's also a very good thing to do, even even if you already have your very specific um, painting style or very specific way of working. If you if you change it up once in a while, it's it's a very good thing to do because you're actually expanding and learning oh, yeah. and getting out of the comfort zone. So yeah, getting out of the comfort zone is the, if you feel like you're getting too comfortable, that's not a good thing. You need to yeah. move forward. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's cool. Um, well, Jama is not back yet. <laughs> hey, um, but yeah, he's it's left. yeah, he's never coming back. <laughs> he just he just died with his computer. He abandoned us. Abandoned, yeah. like fuck those guys. <laughs> fuck this stream. I'm gonna go for beer. Um, no, I, yeah, I you know it's it it can be really challenging. I remember it's just like the the very quick turnaround and switching projects. It's just like you have to be hundred percent focused all the times, and it, it it's really becoming really stressful on your mind. You know, mm-hmm. maybe not as stressful on your like just working itself because uh, even though there is a lot of turnarounds and and fast pace and whatnot, you can still sort of pace yourself to not get. Bur- overburned, you know, yeah. uh, but just you have to be mentally prepared. If you're not, then you will burn out really, really quickly. So it's yeah, I guess it's just like trying to find the balance between. It's like this perfect balance, I guess. It's just mm-hmm. you know, it's safer for you in terms of like continuity of work, but it also means you have to be almost all the time on 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 your toes in terms of like being prepared to switch and being prepared to do something else all of a sudden and, you know, be pre- mentally prepared in the first place. So, Yeah, which leads you yeah, to... Which leads you to you. Ooh, I can't hear myself. John, you have an echo. What's that? You have a bit of an echo. That's better now, I think. Yeah. Jama, how was your beer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't drink, you know that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know you don't drink. Um, yeah, I, w- I was just about to say that, which, speaking of balance, which leads you to, it's very important to sometimes do something outside of work, just right. go for a walk, uh, go travel somewhere, have new experiences, because I know a lot of people, they think that the only way they can enrich their skills and um, creative vocabulary, visual vocabulary is just sit there on their butt and draw or sculpt which is very important but it's also very important as you said the balance of things of course uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you guys do for for having that balance like i myself found you know jujitsu to be sort of like a way to to get out and do something because jujitsu itself is very creative you know it's just like yeah you know, it's almost like human chess you're trying yeah. to f- always conform to the situation and <laughs> and uh, it's great I, I have been doing it uh, as often as I wish, uh, over the last couple of months, it's just I was fucked with work too much, and 
it's kind of my own fault uh, not being selective enough, I guess, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, moving, I'm actually in, in the sort of transition period where I'm moving out of, uh, out of like a L.A. to more sub, 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 suburbia areas where I can focus more on um, having a little more time instead of spending the time in traffic, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that should be good. But yeah, jiu-jitsu for me, it's, it's big, you know. It's, uh, it's not only a good sport, but also clears your mind, you know. You're like thinking about something else or, or not even thinking at all. Almost doing it automatically. So, I guess I'm just curious, like what you guys do. Uh, if there's anything martial similar? Arts, mar- martial arts is is great because it's also an art form in a way. I I do Muay Thai, and I just go try try to go to the gym regularly because we sit on our butt so much. So you gotta exercise, you gotta move, and. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I like Muay Thai for the same reasons you like Jiu Jitsu um, is just different mindset. F- just for an hour or, or two yeah. hours, you you have an ability to completely clear your mind, and it's a different type of thinking. And besides, you like in art, we have our own community. And what I like about martial arts versus gym is that you also have community. You wouldn't see, for example, in your Jiu Jitsu group random people usually it's the same if people are serious about it they it's usually the same people coming to the same place and that's yeah. what i like about it because you grow and develop together exactly now martial martial arts it's great it's it's a very good ego check too uh, you know um, yeah. discipline you- discipline you learn without discipline uh, you're not going to get far in martial arts so same thing is goes for for our industry you got to be disciplined with things yeah. And have some fun. Yeah, it's great. Oh, we're getting a lot of distractions here. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I I absolutely agree. It's it's you know it's not only it's a discipline where you know it actually it's a kind of eye opening because it's it kind of it kind of goes along with what we've been trying to say uh, quite many times is that it's really not about talent. You know, it's all about you know, how much work you put into it. And martial arts is great. It's sort of like a great example of, of this because when you go for Muay Thai or you go for Jiu Jitsu for the first time, you're like absolutely clueless. And it doesn't matter how big you are, how muscled you are, and you know, how fitness you are. It, that, that doesn't really apply anymore because it's all about skills, you know. And how you get those skills, you have to earn them with a lot of time you have to spend, you know. So when I, my first jiu-jitsu class was really opening because I was just like, I was clueless. Like I felt like a three-year-old child among the, among adults, you know, just, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> uh, I could I just couldn't do the most simple things and it, it just required hundreds of hundreds of repetitions to get it right. And it's that, that's the way you, you you learn, and that's the way you learn art as well. And that, I think I think martial arts are probably one of the best things that artists could do, you know, because it kind of it's a different thing, but it has the same principle, you know. It's it's all about you know being humble, having your ego checked, and learning discipline, and being being really on top of your game. And you, you know that it requires a lot of practice, and you you learn it the hard way. You just cannot have your own ego. In a way, because you're gonna get crushed, you know. Someone, someone will just destroy you. There's some always someone who's gonna be much better than you, no matter how hard you're training. So, I'm gonna destroy you. <laughs> um, let me interrupt real quick. So my X split is frozen, and we're kind of like in a spot where we can either do just audio, or I could like cancel the stream and bring it back in a minute once I can restart it. Um, All the technical difficulties. Yeah, I know. Man. It's a crazy one. Um, this one's crazy. So, Maybe we should, yeah, we should pause and because Jama is doing some craziness on the screen, and it'll be good to have yeah. people to. People are saying that they're okay with just audio, but I, I mean, I don't want to make Jama do all this work for no reason. So. Um, if yeah, if guys are okay with just audio, then just let's just keep going, and then Jama, you can relax. Uh. Okay. All right. Let's just keep it as audio then. All right, cool. All right. Okay, 
just before we move on, I, I will tell you uh, the short story how I went uh, uh, to Muay Thai together with Nadia. <laughs> okay, okay. This, this time, I want to hear this story for a while in, inside me, and it started hurting. You know, like she was like, "Hey, man, you should come and join it." And I'm, I'm always like pretty open for new challenges. And I said, "Yes, probably that's the one that I need to do." Okay, we went there. Holy shit, she hit so hard. Like, she hit me a couple of times. I was like, you know one of those uh, smiles that you're trying to smile, but actually it really hurts you? <laughs> Man, oh. it, was, it was a disaster. She is a really strong lady, guys, so don't mis get misled by the way she looks. She can kick your butt. I, <laughs> I felt it myself, and it was great. Well, it was, it was fun. It was fun. It was fun beating up Gemma. It was fun for you, not for Gemma. <laughs> oh, it wasn't fun because I broke a tooth like two weeks before and I replaced it oh. paying insane oh. amount of money. And I didn't have this thing that you put in, inside your mouth. And I was oh, just right. keep saying, like, don't hit me in the face, don't hit me Wait, in the face. Wait, could you elaborate this thing you put inside your mouth? <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, crazy I, I left after like yeah it's a uh, it's a mouth guard it's like, I'm we're done. talking about so yeah yeah mouth guard um, so yeah I'm gonna, dirty. I'm gonna restart the stream because people want to bring it back all right cool so hold on I'm gonna close it I'm gonna like force quit it and then let's see so the stream is probably gonna go down for everyone in the chat for a minute so just hang tight okay we should be back. Awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah. We're back, baby. Uh, <laughs> All right. Jama, you're up. So, Jama, we we're talking about this thing you put in your mouth. Uh, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, so funny. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, when, I, when I went for jiu-jitsu first time, uh, I was, uh, my, my coach said, like, guys wear mouth guards and... Uh, you know, and balls protection, especially when you're guys. And I can say, yeah, you, you should do it when you want to do jujitsu. Do it because you're gonna get a knee in balls quite often, and uh, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I, I I've seen guys hurting a lot because they had no, you know, ball protection, ball cap. Yeah. Um. What are the other things outside of sports that you do too? Myself, I don't yeah. know. It's uh, I kind of I kind of keep it simple, you know. I guess uh, family life kind of replaced everything else, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really have like it just. I'm trying to refocus my life in a way that there's not too many things going on because what happens is that once you get too many. Um, too many uh, things that happen in your life is um, you you're not focused on what is important anymore, or you, you, your focus becoming really scattered, and um, and that hurts productivity. and And that's that's what I've learned. I've learned it in a hard way with um, with things like um, working on too many projects at once. You know, um, I would notice that it's it's awesome to have the extra money and and you know extra credit for the work you do but you're not putting your 100% anymore um, even even if you have a 100% of time of, of a specific day for that project again your mind is so scattered because you know like okay right after this I have this another thing and you almost like you, you're almost ready to finish working mm -hmm. and then you know well you're not because there's a bunch of things that are still left uh, that you have to focus on the rest of the day and you cannot have you cannot have a luxury of saying like, you know what? Maybe it's a good good time to take a break and you know relax and kind of reset your mind. You're just losing that luxury and that really sucks. So, so I decided pretty much to stop doing uh, too many things at once. I, you know, I've started focusing on getting at least one, like getting two or three things that I focus on and putting hundred percent to it, and the results are much better because. Yeah, then you're you're getting you're getting hundred percent out of this instead of seventy, eighty, and and sometimes you can put even like those extra few percent to make it even more significant. And the changes that it that it 
has uh, or the way it affects your life in the long run is is way more significant. Uh, I've been reading uh, the book uh, Eat That Frog uh, oh. that was recommended by my, my buddy Ash Torp and he got that book from Vitaly. I was also reading uh, Darren Hardy's um, What's uh, the book about? Eat That Frog. Oh, uh, Eat That Frog. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 about focusing on on you no know, on on your work on on putting the extra extra percentage to the one thing, uh, and and tackling the most difficult tasks in the first place. You know, it's it's about uh, getting more. It's 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 a book that helps you to kind of refocus. You know, eat that frog is like, it's it's this way of thinking where if you, uh, you know. It's the best, best, the best way to start the day is to start with the most difficult thing. Uh, it's like you have to eat a frog during the day. If you if you do it right away, that's the worst thing that's gonna happen to you most likely during the day. And once you have it over, when you, once you have it done and you're over it, uh, then everything else becomes really really easy for you because you already kind of finish the most difficult task and, and you feel much more positive about having everything else completed. Um, and this book kind of supports uh, other books that I was uh, listening to, uh, Darren Hardy's uh, Compound Effect. And um, there were topics like, there were, there were things that were mentioned in almost every book I've read so far, which is uh, 80% of success and 80% of significance that happens in your life comes from only 20% of the things you do. And all of those books kind of re refocus your your uh, attention into the, the 20% of those tasks that are the most significant for you. And usually they are the most difficult ones to do as well. So when you're in a situation where you focus on too many things at once, then you know, you might be losing opportunity to almost compound uh, the results of that 20% that otherwise you would do better, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty much like the takeaway. And when I when I started looking at this and, and kind of putting some some attention to this thinking and, and actually applying it to the way I, I live my life, I just became way more happier and, you know, and it kind of affects everything, if, you know, work, family and health, you know, when you work on, say, five projects, it's awesome to, to see all that income, you know, but man, you lose everything like you. I had like when I was working on Captain America uh, last year, when I started working on Captain America, I also worked on a couple of other projects and it was just horrible because uh, it was commute working the whole day in a studio and then freelancing. So what I lost was a lot of family life, a lot of, um, you know, I pretty much stopped jujitsu for three months. So I felt shitty, physically shitty, you know, mm -hmm. and lack of sleep. And it just was kind of a downhill, you know, from there. So uh, kind of after this project, I just had to reset and, and yeah. Sleep is very important. A lot yeah, of it is. A lot of people are proud. Oh, I work all night, every day. I can yeah. sleep on for four hours. It all builds up. They say, um, I read recently that they say there is no difference if you sleep eight or nine hours, but there is a big difference if you sleep seven versus eight hours. So once in a while, it's healthy to get your full eight hours of sleep. Of course. No, I mean, four hours of sleep, it will fuck you up. That's yeah, sure. we'll pick up That's with me. me. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was funny because uh, Andrew sent us his um, his uh, sleep cycle. <laughs> like my, I have an app that tracks when I go to sleep and wake up, and like there's a graph over the last three months that just drastically Love goes it. down. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's really sad, actually. Does yeah. it send me any push notifications, warnings? Uh, no. Sleep. I mean, I should probably just no it's a warning like that i'm yeah tired dude all the time and, <laughs> yeah. you've been working your ass off with with learn squared so yeah what do you expect no i mean yeah it's just it just went from eight hour average to like five <laughs> <laughs> it's like a gradual decline so. <laughs>
<laughs> so funny. Uh, well, yeah, sleep is really important and it does affect your productivity, you know, in a very significant way. Because if you sleep, let's say you sleep four hours and you assume, OK, that's four hours of time that you've saved for for doing something extra. Your focus is so abysmal and so minimal. You're getting uh, distracted quite, quite fast. Uh, uh, you, you, all those triggers of distraction, like what are you, oh, I'm going to check Facebook, oh, I'm going to check email, oh, I'm going to check this, oh, I'm going to check that. It's just becoming like a constant stream of interruptions. And you can just waste two or three hours of doing nothing and still feel like you're being productive, but you literally done nothing. Whereas if you're like really rested, you can complete half of the day of, of work in an hour. Like sometimes you can be that productive, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something something to take care of. I'm trying. I, I have a problem with you know timing. I'm I'm getting better at it every week to get like more sleep uh, and you know forego some of some of the things that I had to do during the day or some of the ideas that I wanted to focus on. And it kind of aligns with this uh, idea to yeah focus only on two or three most important things and. And that way you're becoming less stressful. And I guess the next one uh, that helps a lot is sort of plan for buffer, you know, just have extra hours during the week where you didn't plan anything to do. Like there's nothing on your plate that you're going to work on or, or do because that way you have that extra luxury time that you can you will probably like most likely spend on working or doing something extra, but it will be it will not be stressful anymore. It will be something that, all right, I already planned for having this time free. So now if I don't finish this task, I'm not going to, you know, be behind with schedules or anything because this is this is something extra that I've planned. So I'm not being stressed by, by time limits or anything like that. So that's like another thing I'm trying to get into to my life. And I I, would, I highly suggest everyone, you know, have that luxury, have the one thing that a couple of hours during the week that you, you're you not planning for anything. You're just sort of having it just for yourself and you can do whatever you want with that time. You know, if you want to just lay down and do nothing and fart in a the couch, then yeah, it's awesome. You can do that and not feel guilty about it. So, uh, Can I add something, Maciej? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, like completely agree with the stuff you've said. Like I, I've been experiencing some like we down times when I was trying to do like f five projects at a time. It just drains you, you know. Like yeah. your personal life, your health, your concentration, everything is just goes down. It's not uh, absolutely not healthy. Like I, I I know people who 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 keep telling me like oh man I'm working for like, 15 hours a day. I was like okay wait a minute. If you're sitting in front of the computer, it doesn't mean you're working 15 hours. So that's the exactly. Thing. And then when I started actually thinking about how much do I work, I realized that I don't work that much. I just sit around and like you know do some different things. And also the other thing would be like I at some point I realized I need to team up with people that have similar kind of mindset that I do to do work together. That's why actually we're doing this learn square together, right? Yeah, that uh, because, helps. That helps. Yeah, it absolutely helps. Like, and there's nothing about like sometimes we be we being like too egoistic and think, oh, I will do it alone. It, it's it's going to be my baby, and finally end and end up doing nothing. You know, instead of the uh, being like that, I I prefer to team up with people and just like to do stuff together. You know, it's always uh, helps to have teamwork. You know, rather than just trying to do everything by yourself. Yeah, that would make two cents for me. Yeah, there is something about uh, the idea of, uh, you know, you, you're going to reach a level at some point of your life, whether it's now or sometime in the future. Everyone will, you know, might, maybe not everyone, but will, everyone will have an opportunity to reach the point where um, you'll be thinking of like, okay, so I want to do something more that I'm doing right now. Like this is what I'm doing. Whatever I'm doing right now is great, you know, but what if I want to do something more than that? You know, what if there is something else that could be done? And you quickly realize that there is a lot of thing, a lot of awesome things that you could be doing 
but you cannot do them alone. There's no way you can do it alone. And uh, you have to team up with people. You have to kind of shift your way of thinking into more of uh, we rather than I. There's a great book that I've read recently. It's called uh, Tribal Leadership. And uh, it's it's amazing. It talks about different um, different levels of culture, like how uh, especially it's very aimed towards uh, uh, corporate America and uh, kind of breaking down how corporate America is is set up and how much percentage of work workforce is in those different categories. Uh, so, for instance, category one is, uh, is when you're life assumption the way you think about life is that everything sucks everything shitty there's nothing absolutely nothing positive about life and that's, that's like the shittiest you're the shittiest person when you when you're thinking that way um and that's usually people that end up in jail because they're commit, committing crimes and they do it deliberately uh people that you know are are really in a really really bad spot like a very, very shitty pathologic sort of way of thinking. Uh, and there is a there is a level two, which basically means that, you know, my life sucks. Everything about my life sucks, but your life is awesome. And I, I you know, I'm jealous about about you. And, you know, uh, it, the best example of, of this could be DMV. Like when you go to DMV in America, it's like the Department of Motor Services is where you get the driver's license. It's just talking to, you know, to those people is just like, uh, I, th I think they want to kill themselves because they work here, you know. Um, and they're not really supportive. They will do the j their job because they have to, but it's not that they want to do that job, you know. And then the third level is, which is the most common, is... Uh, it says I'm awesome, you know, but there is a caveat, but it, it also says but you're not Which means uh, there's a lot of competition where people think like I I'm the best and you're the shittiest, you know Like my work is better than yours Fuck you <laughs> I'm gonna prove you wrong. I'm gonna prove you that I'm better than you and that's like a very competitive way of thinking um, It works on your personal level when you when you're building your own career uh, but eventually, you realize that if you want to reach something greater than uh, than you're having right now, you have to be on the fourth uh, fourth level, which is um, which is pretty much uh, we are awesome. Like generally, we are awesome. You know, uh, whether it's a company you work for, you, you have this feeling that everyone in the company is on the same on the same track. Nobody's. Uh, talking only about themselves and everyone is uh, gearing towards the same goal you know your competition is not another company your competition is a specific problem that you want to tackle you know like great company and it's pretty much uh, the company I, I've learned uh, or the, the CEO that was talking about uh, the tribal leadership leadership book was a CEO of, of uh, Zappos Zappos is considered to be one of the, you know, best customer service companies on earth, you know, like this is, it's, it's a company that sells shoes online. That's, that's pretty much it, right? Um, but there's no other company that has a policy where you can uh, return merchandise uh, after, even after 365 days. Like you, you can keep the shoes for like a year and then return them uh, if they're in like a good condition, right? Or... There is no other company that gives you shipping for free, no matter if you like the the product or not, and you want to turn it back. They'll they'll ship. You can ship it back for free. Like even Amazon, in Amazon, Amazon is considered to have like a really good um, uh, uh, service. You know, they they will still ask you to pay for for shipping costs. You know, if you want to ship something back, Zappos will never do that. They will actually ship stuff for you, so you have it in a couple of hours. They will like upgrade your shipping, even even if it costs them money. You know, because yeah. they are all about customer service. And and that's the CEO. It's his, his name is Tony Shea. He was talking about that book. That's where I learned learned about this book from. And it's you know when you think about this, it's just like um, yeah, you reach that point where it's not about me anymore. It's about what I want, like, it's about something that I'm aiming for, right? I cannot do this alone, so I have to, I have to find people that are like-minded, that we can be in this together. It's, it's not about me anymore. It's about us. You have, we have the same goal. 
we want to deliver the same thing. We want to do. We want to do the same thing, and we want to make sure that you know uh, we can do it. And the great thing about this way of thinking is that you stop thinking. When, once you stop thinking about yourself only, but as a collective, there is no more politics involved. There is no more like hmm, I, I'm gonna do this to get the better end of the deal, you know, or I'm gonna do that and that's gonna get me better benefits in the long run. That's what happens in the most companies, like you, especially video games, for instance. You know, uh, most of the video games companies still have that you know, level three way of thinking where everyone is kind of doing their own thing. Everyone is like, I'm going to create the most badass assets for this game. And I don't give a fuck if they match to the game or not. I'll have to be forced to fix it. You know, that's what that's why so many games are done in a way that they just have to crunch because everyone is thinking everyone is having big ego. Everyone is thinking that their stuff is the best. So that means that you know uh, uh, my texture is going going to be better than your concept. Like I know better than your concept, so I'm gonna fucking do it the best, you know. But usually it means more problems, you know. And, yeah, um, actually, I totally completely agree with it. Um, I have to tell. I joined MPC two years ago, and I can I can certainly say that I was blessed with a team. Um, people that work on our team, we just got. I guess it's luck, stars aligned, but everyone is really awesome and everyone has a completely different background and skill set uh their own strengths so we just bounce the energy of each other my learning before i was a freelancer and i definitely can say that my learning curve got so much steeper first of all when i joined the team because we all share the knowledge it's the same yeah. as uh you guys uh you're not keeping it all to yourself you organize this learn uh, online learning course where you're sharing your knowledge and I think it's very important so same thing happens in smaller teams and it's very important not to be an asshole because uh, if you're part of the team you have to be a team player yeah and, and uh, to have a good leader like I was I was mentioning before that we we have a, an amazing team we have uh, two really great le leaders Jessica and Ravi Ravi is our art director and we learn from each other from each other's experience and everyone is nice so yeah just uh, Keep working hard, share share the love, and don't be an asshole. Yeah, that's a good good ending note. Let's let's get to the QA. I would All say. Right. Cool. Um, so Hayden on Facebook said um, he's wondering how much he kind of had trouble wording it, and I'm gonna kind of have trouble saying it too. But like he's wondering how much lack of detail you can get away with in art, such as leaving things as suggestions rather than detailing them. I think um, this I can find that one a little bit. Sir, sir, John? Uh, well, I, I can uh, tell my opinion about that. Like, no, uh, but I would give it from 3D perspective point of view. Like, uh, like I said in the beginning, I was I wanted to show a little bit of 3D code, and I think that's the proper program when you actually suggest details. You're not paint like you're not modeling those details, and it's all. Uh, Obviously, it's a very relative question. Like in some works, you need to make everything de detailed. But what I think, like for, especially for concept art, you can get away with a lot of suggestions. Like especially, for example, if you like painting something like a big environment, you don't need to put detail everywhere. You just put detail wherever the focal point is. And for example, it comes to 3D as well. Like. Uh, why would I model everything like in high resolution if afterwards I will I won't be able seeing like half of it because of the lighting and the texture and all other things? So my opinion is that you just need to put enough details to sell your idea. That's all about ideas, like, and that's probably a little bit different from illustration because illustration is something different. What we are doing, we're doing like concept art for films or like games and our main pur purpose is to sell the ideas to the client and they don't care if it's suggested or it's real all they care about if this picture sells the idea or design behind it so that was my opinion uh yeah i completely agree uh i would uh i would compare it to language so if art if if art is um 
is is just a form of language, form of speaking. You just speak in pictures instead of using words. When you describe in literature, when you describe, let's say, a nice day, you're not going to describe every building around you, every person that comes by. You just describe enough to sell the mood, to make the audience understand what, what you want to, to suggest. Um, you, you need to choose your ba battles, basically, how much you need to say in order to sell the idea, in order to communi communicate clearly and leave out the noise that might distract from seeing that main idea. Yeah, I would agree totally. And also, coming back to the previous conversation we had, because it's all about ideas, and especially when you're working in team, you need to understand that everything you do is not like a... Like, I know people who are so precious about the stuff they've done, and they even don't allow you to change them. It, <laughs> it makes so many troubles because of it. Like, it's a teamwork. All we do care is about, like, to make a good design that makes sense. And if anything doesn't make sense, even if it looks most beautiful, like, you look, even, even your brushstroke, even if your brushstroke looks like the most beautiful thing in the world, but it doesn't make sense, you just get rid of it. And yeah, that's that's it. Cool. Um, the next question is: How do you deal with long render times in a studio environment? Like in regards to when there's like a super strict deadline and really heavy projects going on. Well, John, I guess well, you know this question better. Well, I've. <laughs> it's a tricky one. I, I think in the end of the stream, everybody's going to hate me because I keep talking bad stuff about other softwares. Like, I'm so well known for calling Modo crap, so I think they're going to sue me soon. Uh, uh, well, I think, like, I use Keyshot. That's why I never bother about rendering time. And in Keyshot, you just screen grab. You don't go and wait for the render. Like, a good alternative for it would be Octane or programs like that, like, where you actually see what you're rendering. You don't need to wait. That's the main point. Like, that's why I like 3D Code and Keyshot. That they give me almost real-time feedback, almost like if I was paying in Photoshop, uh, painting in Photoshop. And uh, uh, meanwhile, in the, like, when you're waiting, you're just not as creative, and you, you, you don't have that artistic freedom when you're waiting because you need to follow your instincts and do change stuff as you go so that's why i'm using keyshot and for my 3d stuff i'm using 3d code but it's all personal choice even though like i keep saying moto is crap that one is crap i honestly believe all of those programs they're amazing you just need to find the the one that fits you and the the one that makes you happy but don't complain about rendering times if you're going for moto <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's uh i guess um to kind of rephrase uh the way i would i would look at it is every single program has its good and bad things about it you know uh when you think about large scenes and rendering times yeah moto is probably not ideal you know that's why i stopped using moto because everything i do is so heavy uh i just had to switch switch back to software that everyone is complaining about and everyone is saying is really shitty 3ds max you know <laughs> And and you know, but 3ds Max does the job really well. It 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 does the rendering. Uh, it has all the access to all those rendering softwares that do the the rendering stuff really quick. You know, um, it handles large scenes very well. I have never have had issues with, like some of my files that I work on for like clients. They're like four gigs uh, size. You know. And I never had had any issues opening them and working within them. They're still smooth enough for me to work. You know, um, same goes to rendering. You know, I'm using Octane. I'm using V-Ray. V-Ray is great for one things, and Octane is better for others. You know, uh, you're always going to run into issue of rendering times if you if you're going really heavy. But eventually, you know, it's it's worth it because because yeah, it's like once you do, do something in 3D. You have so many unlimited options from there, you know, because mm. you just switch camera angle and you have a new illustration that way. So yeah, that brings me to a good question from Eddie. It says, "When do you guys think that uh, it's a good idea to start getting into 3D to generate concepts? At what stage of your artistic abilities would be good to start?" Yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, just just to kind of give you uh, give you uh, a good idea in film in uh, Los Angeles uh, when you work in film for 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 Guild and I'm not I'm not even gonna mention MPC and Frame Story because it, it's really heavy there. But in film in in Los, like when you work for for the Guild, uh, most of the people that don't know 3D they don't work anymore. They just they just don't. I maybe know two or three people that are so fucking amazing in, in illustrating with Photoshop that they, and they're so, they know so many people, they've worked on so many projects that they always get jobs. But otherwise, most of the people that cannot use 3D, they are not getting jobs anymore. So, at least in film. Um, I, yeah. What about like on a personal level though, like for individuals, like should they be learning 3D before they learn 2D, for instance? I would well, say learn both I, at the same time. Don't you guys agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Like, I, I, I want to just support with a little bit more information for, for, for what uh, Maciej said. Like, I truly believe, like, in three, four years, like, most of the concepts, they will be done in 3D, like, and in proper 3D, like, 3D in real time. Because we, we have VR coming out this uh, year or next year and right now I'm, I'm seeing like you can make a real time asset in one day like this is something that you wouldn't be able to it wasn't possible to do something like that like even two years ago that's why my chain is right when you, yesterday was the time when you, we had to start learning this thing and like and it will get even more and more advanced with each year like uh, real-time rendering, Unreal, Marvel, so they will play a huge role in the concept art because uh, you will be able in one day concept everything, sketch everything on the paper or in Photoshop or in your head, model everything, texture it, put in real-time engine and present to the client in forms of like not just static pictures but as a 3D environment or 3D asset or 3D vehicle or 3D gun or whatever you want to do. And coming to the second Second question, uh, uh, what to start from? I truly believe, and many people hate me, but I, I believe that you should start with 2D because like, things like composition and like the basic fundamentals of art and design, uh, you can use the old books for those. You don't need like a program for those. You don't, it's about 2D or 3D. It's all about fundamentals. And once you get the solid fundamentals, then you can put any kind of new technology on top of it. And I know many people who are doing 3D, like who starting. Students keep asking me, like, "What's my trouble?" And when I look at their work, I understand that it's not about software. It's not about the render they do. It's all about they lack the fundamental knowledge of composing pictures, making good decisions, making right decisions that will improve their design or uh, overall image making. And that's why I keep saying, like. I'm so lucky that I started like as a 2D artist and then slowly shifted to 3D because it was a really smooth transition for me. It wasn't something like uh, alien to me. It was just a different tool, but I just used all my knowledge that I had in 2D and all my design knowledge and all my composition knowledge, and then I just applied the same knowledge to 3D space. So that's it. Hope it makes sense. Um... So a question to Nadia is, I've recently been listening to the in interview with Scott Ross who was saying that the VFX industry is quite a tough field. What is your opinion about that? Quite a tough field in what way? Um, that it's kind of just like, I mean, Maciej, you were on the R Cafe too. Like, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, what Scott, like what Scott is going down from now, perspective like, of illustration it's different because um, you know when you when you do illustration and you work in illustration, it's it, you have way more options to choose from. You know, uh, it's illustration is a very creative field, and uh, you know if you even if you work in VFX, as I was, as we were talking in the beginning, there is a huge shift in in VFX studios where they would jump into the projects very early on, and you know it's then it's uh, the structure payment structures become different as well. You know. 
uh, when we when you deliver a concept. I, I'm not sure exactly how what the deals are between like let's say VFX studios and the studios when it comes to production like pre-production or production. You know, it it might be I might be wrong about this. Uh, what what Scott was referring to is how VFX are done and how fucked up the uh, the contracts are where it's uh, where it's fixed price, but it's fixed price from perspective of how much money this, the the VFX studio is getting, but it's not fixed on how much time they're spending on making the shots, you know? Because if, uh, if there is a script change or a change in idea, like director want to change something, that's not reflected with uh, VFX studio go, go, coming up and saying, okay, this is going to cost this and this much extra. No, this is kind of... This is kind of throw on them. They have to deal with it, you know. So that was uh, that was what uh, Scott was referring okay. to. Yeah, I think I think I would be the wrong person to ask this question. I think Scott expanded on it enough. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to add anything he knows uh, way better. Um, so I, I wouldn't have anything to add to this really. Um, okay, so Andres asks. How do you study or create a portfolio in order to get into a certain company? Should I just try to emulate the artist's style to get that type of job, or should I just copy the core concept? Uh, just look at, I would say, just look at the benchmark, latest benchmark uh, of what's required in the industry. Look at the company's portfolios. Like, uh, I know Framestore and MPC, we have um, our portfolio website. See what the company is doing uh, for the projects and just try to hit the benchmark. That's uh, look at the artists who are currently working in the industry. Look at work of look at Masha's work. Look at S Stephen Messing's work, Jama's work. Everyone's who is uh, currently working in the industry and try to see what's what makes their their work so so good, so in demand by the clients. I don't think that style matters a lot. Again, if you can, if you work 3D or you're very successfully delivering the idea in 2D, fair enough. As uh, you guys mentioned, there are still artists who are working in pencil. For example, uh, we work with this amazing artist sometimes. His name is Stefan Levalois. He only works in pencil and his work is incredible and he's highly in demand because he found his own way to sell his brilliant ideas. And again, it all comes back to the ideas. So yeah, idea is number one, and then see what's the latest industry benchmark. And that's basically the formula for your portfolio. Cool. Uh, in terms of idea, we have another question from Adam who says, uh, is there a difference in level of detail that you put into early concepts as an in-house artist versus freelance for VFX? So like to get ideas out, are they looser than what you would submit if you were freelance? It's the I guess same. Oh, sorry. Go for yeah, it. I, I think it's the same. It doesn't really matter. Like as you said, uh, Nadia. I mean, freelancers are hired for a specific job, you know. Yeah. Um, and the the more ver versatile you are, the, the more likely you're gonna stay with the company and you know create more assets and become full full um, a staff member. You know. I guess the the more fair question would be, when you put more details, if you're if you're a freelancer versus in-house artist, I think uh, the amount of details um, depends on what kind of assi assignment you're working on. So if it's a quick turnaround, quick ideas for a general concept, you don't need too many details, you just need an overall uh, description of your idea versus when you're doing some um, illustration, like key key art for with, with lots of, um, 3D and um, photo elements involved. It doesn't really matter if you're a freelancer or in-house artist. You just need to know what's the final goal of the images. What are you trying to do? So I, I don't think it depends on either you're a freelancer or in-house artist. It depends on the assignment. Um, and then I think we have time for one more question uh, from Stylo. He says, um, which creative medium would you love to pursue but haven't yet? Um, well, I saw first I saw Jama showing this 3D code program, 
and I really I really liked it personally. That's that's what I'm trying to learn at the moment. The reason for it is that I come from a traditional background. I studied fine art and illustration, and I still rely on my 2D skills quite heavily. I mean, I know 3D just enough to get by, but <clears throat> I'm learning more of it because, and I like 3D code just because it has this natural feeling. It has, it, I think it's a smooth transition for a 2D artist into 3D world because it retains this traditional medium feel. I guess the energy that you have in a pencil sketch versus something very sterile, the sterile feeling of 3D that you see sometimes. So that's what I'm trying to learn at the moment. What about you, Jana? I'm done, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jana yeah. is, is like, oh, uh, yeah, the thing that no one announced yet, it doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm already learning that. No, no, no. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, like, uh, I'm already doing my first steps in directing. I'm doing this short film with a friend of mine. Uh, and it's a long-term project, so I, I definitely see myself shifting towards our directing at some point like our directing first and then parallel to this i'm doing my own short films and yeah I'm, I'm pretty busy like i don't have free time right now and i'm pretty happy that i don't it means like there's still a lot of things that excite me in terms of art and in terms of the new challenges so yeah yeah i'll never give up guys telling you <laughs> Don't you, give up. Um, I've been into like, well, obviously I've been working in 3D for quite a while now, and I kind of went back a little bit to traditional media because I've never done it uh, properly uh, with um, with the art habit. I had to stop art habit for for brief amount of time because of the amount of stuff we have to do with Learn Squared. It's just so <laughs> fucking a lot. <laughs> Um, but I eventually gonna like I plan to get back to it really soon uh, because I did enjoy doing those sketches and everything. But from like perspective of uh, development of like what would be next is um, animation, VR, you know, almost creating concepts to be interactive, you know, be or at least animated or at least so that you can kind of uh, rotate the camera around and see what's going on in the concept, not just the uh, you know, canvas that is uh, two-dimensional, but just having a canvas that you can like, you open a file and, and you rotate around. Whether it's a whether it's an Unreal uh, Engine file where you can just walk around the character that is being designed, or or a fly-through camera animation or something like that. Things like that is what I'm putting my free time into, which I have like zero free time right now. Um, but at least I'm trying, you know, so. Cool. Um, I guess you want to wrap it up then? Yeah, let's wrap it up. It was a good episode, guys. It was a good episode. Yeah, I mean, uh, fun to have you guys here. Nice meeting you, Nadia. Nice and meeting you. It's been good stuff, good questions, good answers. Thanks for everyone joining. And I hope, uh, yeah, I hope uh, this one was helpful again. Um uh, I will stress. I, I cannot stress it more. Uh, paste like post your ideas. Like uh, we have the the Art Cafe face group, uh, Facebook group, and we have Art Cafe Facebook page. And if you have an idea, we're like, hey guys, like what if we could talk about this? Uh, then just post it up on uh, on the Facebook page, uh, the Art Cafe Facebook page, and and or send a private message to, whether it's it's to me or Andrew, like. What ex what would be exciting for you to for us to talk about? I'm always inviting like cool people. I'm trying to invite like the best people and people I know to have like a because uh, people I, I try to invite are usually very prolific and, and and very you know knowledgeable and and really fucking awesome people in general. Uh, so so it's almost almost granted that conversation will be you know interesting. Um, at least I hope so. <laughs> um, but but generally, you know, like if you have ideas, uh, if you know, like we had the suggestion once about lighting artists. You know, no, no, there was a lot of people that didn't quite understand, and 
that's why we got Vivian on the last episode. And I'm always trying to invite like really cool people. And that's so, almost like a byproduct of, of me trying to get this to be as interesting as possible. But any subject will matter. So yeah, just post your ideas. It's all about you guys. It's all, this, is, this is for you. This is, uh, this is supposed to answer all your questions that you might have. So I highly encourage people to do that. So Cool. We're going to set up the uh, portfolio review soon. Too. Yeah, we gotta still get the details from one of the last winners of that contest. So, cool. Cool. All oh, much right. uh, and then uh, we're well, waiting a minute. We are not done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for organizing this. Like, I know, like, it sounds so easy to put up, like, put together an art cafe or any kind of stream, but I know. It's a lot of effort, so thank you guys. Like Andrew, I know your schedule. You like sleeping two hours a day, and you know you're my hero. Maciej, thank you as well for inviting me. And yeah, guys, yeah, no worries, dude. Anytime, like anytime you guys want to join, just just let me know. Even if it's uh, if, even if we already had guests, you know, if we have guests, everyone who have been a guest so far, it's really in, like you you guys are free to join. You Thanks know? for having us. When you see this happening live and you, you see me and Andrew on Skype or maybe AJ on Skype, just call in like, hey, I want to join. And uh, that would be awesome. Anytime. Cool. 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 All right, guys. Thank uh, you. Have, have a great day or have a good night, depending on where you are. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone.